Ken Franklin, president of Amalgamated Transit Union. The trains, the trains that move Chicago. And we are here in solidarity with the rest of the unions, the rest of the labor movement, because this, this is what we have to grow in order to keep what we have. This is what we have to do. We have to assemble and fight or the businessmen, the politicians that have failed us, the special interest groups are going to have their way. We are on our last leg and this has to grow and continue in order for us to keep our benefits, our wages, our families, our health care, because everything they're doing is to take away what you have today. Chicago Public Schools made the decision to lay off 950 of my co-workers. This is just reckless. These layoffs mean that I and other SICAs, teachers and support staff, are asked to take on more responsibility, which ultimately cuts back the time and the attention that we can give our students who really need it the most. Instead of offering more support to our children and the workers who provide these services for them, CPS, Governor Rauner, politicians like him choose to play political games with our lives. We will continue fighting together for 15 and union rights because unless workers in every region of the country can win union rights, corporations and politicians will continue to rig the system and workers will lose. Workers aren't going to take it anymore. In 2018, we're going to replace Rauner with someone who respects workers and demands know where to start with J.B. Pritzker uh, because, you know, I'm a union member, I pay union dues, and nobody asked me what I think about J.B. Pritzker, so I don't understand how all the unions in Illinois can endorse him. I didn't vote to endorse him, you know. I don't, we have a billionaire governor. I don't understand why the Democrats need their own billionaire governor. I can't think of any instance where this has worked out for, for the center, for the liberals, or for the left, where they handpick somebody like that and run them. Well, you know what, what Chris goes ask, and he says he claims he will support graduated income tax. Yeah, I mean, the thing is, is we don't need billionaires to convince other billionaires to pay their taxes. The thing about paying taxes and the thing about funding, you know, public assets, it's not about having a nice conversation and asking politely. It's about taking it, you know. All of these power, politics, the labor movement, it's about taking power. It's not about asking for power. My union doesn't have, we don't have, I don't have the paycheck I have, the benefits I have, the working conditions I have because we asked the boss nicely. We have it because we went out and took it. And I don't understand how J.B. Pritzker thinks he's going to ask nicely and be able to collect taxes. We have to go out and take them. And I'm sorry, J.B. Pritzker, if you're a billionaire, but we're going to take some of your money and we're going to pay for our schools with it. I remember in, in 2011, the protest against the Pritzkers and their, their, you know, their hotels and how they treat their workers. I mean, if the Pritzkers were really pro-union and pro-worker, all of their hotels would be union, and they're not. All right, I, I cannot speak for Northern Illinois Jobs with Justice as a whole. I was deeply disappointed and angry that the Illinois Federation of Labor chose to endorse J.B. Pritzker for governor of Illinois. Uh, here, Pritzker is a man who uh, well, his family owns hotels in Chicago and they abused and exploited their workers. Their workers went on strike for years and the Pritzker family held out and just wouldn't give in to those workers for anything. They were, they are union busters, they are anti-worker, especially the poorest of the poor. Uh, so here, why would the Illinois uh, branch of the AFL-CIO endorse such a man? I can only guess that it has to do with the fact that he's very wealthy and they think we need a billionaire to fight against another billionaire. And I think that's cowardly and craven. 
and uh, I'm, I'm hurt and angry about it. I'm a, a volunteer with Northern Illinois Jobs with Justice. I go out and stand on picket lines for workers. I do it because I think the cause of labor is right, morally right, and I think it's important. It's our way of pushing back against corporate power. Here we are at a time when economic inequality, I believe, is the biggest problem we've got. It's at the root of the triumph of the right wing in our politics. It's at the root of all these attacks on workers. It's at the root of this uh, climate denial. The 1% are not our friends. And for uh, labor, organized labor, to be trying to cozy up to a billionaire in Illinois is, is, makes me sick. Uh, we need to fight back, and this is not the way to fight back. Also, I wonder, were the rank and file consulted in that endorsement decision? Were they given a voice? Did they choose who they wanted to endorse? I would like to know. Mimi 
Max Wayne. I work at Holy Cross Hospital. I work at Holy Cross Hospital for the last six and a half years. I make only 22% of my minimum wage. 22 cents. That's not right, y'all. A person, a person can't survive of that kind of wages, especially when they are dedicated their life to work to help other people. To drive from where I live to the hospital, it eats up a lot of my wages and gas. But guess what? I only drive to every day. I get up at 445 in the morning so I can stop and pick up a few co-workers All right. so we can so we can get there on time. We all, we all get 100% to the hospital, but they don't give it back. It's not right. We need, we need the strength for hospital workers across the city to demand to be paid what we work. Come on, man. Right. My name is Marcia Madison. I work at Brooklyn Methodist Hospital in New York, and I'm a proud union member. I started at my hospital in 2008 as a nursing assistant, making $14.60 an hour. Did you hear me? Today, I'm a nurse technician, and I'm making $22.50 an hour. Hello, Chicago! Because in New York, 90,000 hospital workers stand together in our union with the power to set the standard in our job. Did you hear me? Oh. We set the standard in our job. My union not only means I get paid what I'm worth. All right. It means it mean I know when my next race is coming. Because of our union in New York, we negotiate our raises. Did you hear me? We negotiate our wages. Now, let me begin by offering words of support for our immigrant brothers and sisters, particularly those who came to this country as children as their parents sought a better quality of life. Let me offer a few words of clarity and sanity to the Trump administration regarding our hard-working immigrant family. We urge President Trump not to end the DACA program and instead to develop a common sense approach to address the complex issue of immigration that faces this country. All right, all right. Are y'all with me on that? Yes. We know that unions are the solution to fixing our broken economy that is rigged in favor of the rich. It's rigged in favor of people like our governor, Bruce Rauner, who uses his office to attack working families. Yeah, boo on that. Who uses his office to attack working families and enrich his buddies who already have more money than they could ever spend. The days of the rich, robbing the poor, coming to an end. Is that right? The great trade unionist A. Philip Randolph once wrote, at the banquet table of nature, there are no reserved seats. You get what you can take, and you keep what you can hold. If you can't take anything, you won't get anything. And if you can't hold anything, you won't keep anything. And you can't take anything without organization. You can't take anything without organization. You can't take anything without your union. You can't take anything without your union. We need to understand that the battle for labor rights and living wages has always been a battle in the soul of America, and America has always had some form of strange schizophrenia when it comes to workers from the outset of this nation's founding. Certain forces didn't want to honor workers. Only white landowners were given the right to vote. White 
workers, working poor white males and females were legally excluded from the political process. For 250 years of chattel slavery and a system of free labor but full employment was the law of the land. I said free labor but full employment. Free labor, free forced labor built this country. Just last night, reports came out in the middle of the night. We used to say back in my day, the freaks come out at night. A freaky decision came out at night. Said Trump's gonna end DACA for young Latino dreamers, students, who were brought here, and he's trying to pit you against them. Because the rationale is, he's claiming that he's making a decision based on his love for the American worker. And we've got to resist that kind of demonation, resist that kind of otherization. And we need to tell him and tell all of those supporting him, we're coming for you, black, white, Latino, gay, straight, young, old, north, south, east, west, and we will not be divided. See, Reverend Jackson, when we can have 26 presidential debates on both sides of the aisle, and not one hour dedicated to living wages, not one hour where the workers are asking the questions. Not one hour on systemic racism. Not one hour on the war economy. We are fighting for the soul of this nation. When unions are castigated and lied on, sure, like any human institution, unions have had their struggles. You have struggles in your local. But if it had not been for union, there'd be no 40-hour work week. There'd be no minimum wage. There'd be no labor protection. There'd be no benefits. And there'd be no civil rights movement. Because the march on Washington was not a march to sing kumbaya. Ask him, he was there. It was a march for jobs and freedom. We're in a battle. When 42% of all workers in the US earn less than $15 an hour. Hear this, media. I didn't say 42% of just black folk. 42% of all the workers. And more than half, over 50% of African Americans make less than $15 an hour. 60% of Latinos, but in raw numbers, it's more whites. Because there are 8 million more white people that are poor than there are African Americans and 5 million more than Latinos. There are over 102 million poor and working poor people in America. At a time when Joseph Stiglitz in his book, The Price of Inequality, reminds us that 400 families make an average of $97,000 an hour while we are locking people up who fight for 15. Voter registration in most states, except here, give yourselves a hand right here in Illinois. Give the hand. But in most states, voter registration is not automatic. But in every state, registration for the draft is automatic. If I can be automatically registered for the draft, I ought to be automatically registered to vote on the people that set the policy that take us to war. fighting for the soul when the people who love, who have to live policies are often the ones who are suppressed from voting for the people who make the policies. We're fighting, we're fighting, we're fighting for the soul. We need long-term, permanent, transformational policies. Give everybody health care. Give everybody automatic registration. Give everybody equal protection under the law. Give it, welcome every immigrant. Have a heart, America. Guarantee everybody a living wage. Save the soul of this nation.
Don't build walls, build bridges. Have a heart. Don't tear families apart. Bring families together. Have a heart. Lift this country.